Well, it's time to begin. So, so far, many of our panels have focused on course-level blended learning. This particular panel, however, is looking at institutional blended learning. Uh, and so we want to look specifically at ways we can support the adoption of blended learning and other technology-enhanced teaching practices at that institutional level. And the presenters at this uh, session are going to share and evaluate three approaches they've used at each of their schools. Uh, we do have three presentations. I ask our presenters to limit themselves to 20 minutes so that we do have some time for questions at the end. I think especially given our topic, some questions at the end are very important for us. Uh, our first presenters are Joe Montcalm and Elizabeth Becker from St. Joseph's University. And they're going to talk about collaboration and the three bear approach to iterative development to improve learning. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank Elizabeth for um, inviting us to come to the conference. We actually spoke about this at the Drexel conference, and Elizabeth uh, saw it and thought it might be appropriate here, so I hope you guys find it enjoyable. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about one project that we did and how that has helped us to um, expand into helping the entire university. Um, I'm going to get more into the instructional technology side of it. Um, up here is our contact information, so if you have any questions that don't come up here, feel free to email us or uh, my Twitter hashtag is up there as well. So uh, Elizabeth is going to start by telling us a little bit about where uh, the impetus was for this project and why we did it. Thanks, Joe. Um, I feel very lucky because I get to teach the capstone course for our behavioral neuroscience program. And in that course, students are conducting a semester-long research project aimed at looking at the consequences of a brain lesion or brain damage on the behavior of a rat. It's a really cool project. And at the end of the semester, I asked students, or at least traditionally, I asked students to disseminate the results via a research paper and a research talk. So we're talking about a traditional PowerPoint presentation. And much to my horror, much to my surprise, those presentations were really crappy. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. They were terrible. Um, and it was shocking because they loved the class and they loved the research process. So in reflecting on why students aren't performing well, I always think it's my fault. Is it something that I'm doing or not doing that's the root cause of the problem? And I thought about it. When I give a, a talk or when I write a research paper, I know there's an audience on the other side that's really excited and engaged in what I'm going to be talking about. And for the students generating these assignments for a grade, they didn't have that experience. So what I wondered was, you know, how could I create a scientific community? How could I make that experience more authentic for them? And could I possibly look to technology to be the way to set that up? Um, so that was sort of the problem that I came in with. Technology was certainly going to be my answer, and maybe even iPads was what I wanted to use. I'm not a Luddite, but I had no idea where to go from there. So you'll notice throughout the presentation that we've set it up like a story. Um, one of the things that we implemented in her class was how to tell a digital story and use that instead of, in some cases, writing a paper. Um, and that helped to engage the students a little bit, and we'll get into that. So you have the three bears going here. Um, some of the way, so our goal, so I'm the, the Senior Director of Instructional Technology at St. Joe's up the street. Um, so Elizabeth came to us with this really great idea that she wanted to use for her students, and she didn't know how to do it. So we, where we come in, we don't want to get in the way of what she wants to do, but we really want to help her to do what, how, do, we really want to help her with how to do it. We want to make sure that the technology that we're implementing is really in service of the learning outcomes that she's trying to achieve for her students. So one of the first things that we uh, realized, so my group was formed about three years ago. I've been at St. Joe's for about 13 years. Uh, we just combined a government grant project that did online learning with uh, the IT portion of instructional technology into one group under the office of the provost. So we still have a really good relationship with information technology, and that comes into play a lot. Um, but when we formed, we had to figure out a way to let everybody know who we were now and what services we offered. So just a few of the ways that we kind of branded ourselves um, so the faculty knew how to find us. We do a technology resource for every year that's open to most, to, that's open to all faculty, and we target that at uh, new faculty so that they know as soon as they come in, they have these resources available. On the right there is a graphic of, um, that we came up with just to outline the services that we offer to make it really clear to them what they're getting when they come up to our offices. So you see uh, we have a, a portion that does purely faculty engagement. Uh, my section does course development, course design and production services, and we also have a copyright and compliance officer on staff, which I found is a luxury. 
and everybody's mad at me that we have that. Um, <laughs> so and, and a big one that we do is the teaching and learning forum. That's actually an internal conference that we're doing on June 5th this year. We've been doing it, this is our fourth year of doing it. Um, and that's where we bring together all the faculty at the university. It's sponsored by our group and IT jointly. Um, and we have a number of things that go on there. We usually get about 100 to 150 of our faculty to, to come to that as well. So one of the things that we did with IT was we, we pulled uh, some of our budgets together. So we contributed an equal amount and created something called the Technology Innovation Fund. The faculty can apply for the fund, tell us what they want, what technology they want to use and how they want to use it in the classroom. And once they get the, once they receive the funding, um, we'll provide them with the products and then we swoop in and, and help them um, to figure out how they want to implement, implement those. Um, we look at the applications too to make sure that we're not using technology because it exists. We're using it because it's going to actually serve a learning goal and we can see even if the faculty member um, may not have the most appropriate idea for the technology, they could, it could be an interesting core there that we can use. And we'll go back and forth with the faculty even before we grant um, the grant um, to make sure that what we're going to do is going to has a chance to be successful. So back to me, it's all about me. Um, you know, in my course, how do I just like find... a faculty member? Right, <laughs> yeah. right. we're good friends. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, how do we get back to you know, the support that I need? And the things that Joe was talking about that absolutely was important for me. I met people at New Faculty Orientation. And when I showed up at the teaching forum, I saw the cool things that faculty were doing that were funded by this teaching innovation fund. And I said, okay, who can help me? This is what I want to do. Who's the guy? And they introduced me to Joe right there. So um, having these resources on campus is really critical. And advertising those to faculty is really important. So that's how we met. Um, the, the middle, the chapter two of this, um, we're going to talk about how we built up the relationship. And then chapter three is the products that we came up with and how we implemented this for the students. Um, and then we'll give you some takeaways about uh, what we learned and how we're extrapolating this uh, to, to more and more faculty members. So it, when we first, when she first came to us with this project, uh, the first thing that we do, and I talked, I talked about this a little bit already, um, we usually try and bring the faculty member in for an initial meeting, um, whether uh, they think they need it or not. We try and force it because even if they have a really great idea that's going to work exactly as they plan, um, it's always good to brainstorm, right? So it's always good to get a couple more perspectives and maybe we come up with something a little bit better than we even thought could exist. So that's what we do in this initial needs analysis. Um, and you'll see too that what ends up happening is, is usually is the faculty member comes to us with an idea, we throw something back, they throw something back, and it keeps going back and forth like that. Really, and if it's a good relationship, that keeps on keeps going on forever, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. So we knew what Elizabeth came to the table with. She got one of these technology innovation funds um, to get iPads in her classroom, and she wanted to use the iPads to do digital storytelling to create some assignments that would replace the traditional papers that were crappy. Um, she also came in knowing that she wanted to have weekly assignments, um, and uh, an interesting portion of this, Elizabeth will tell you about, there was also a collaboration with the high school um, and then she knew she wanted to have a long-form video final project. Um, so do you want to speak a little bit to the, the purpose of those? The collaboration? Yeah, well, I think it's going back to that feeling of authenticity. How do I create an audience? Well, I made an audience by these weekly blogging assignments. So we came up with something, a way of building a scientific community. The students were then responsible to a, a new community of high school students. So it's a great collaboration. And the final video project, that was a more... Um, engaging and exciting way for them to disseminate their work to um, both their classmates, me, and, and their high school partners. So a small example of one of the things that came up, even though she had all these great ideas and we, we were really excited to work with her, we saw this final project that was a 10-minute video. None of these students had ever done any media before. So they were coming in scared, essentially, after the first class, wondering how they were going to do this. One of the things that we suggested to Elizabeth is that she add to her syllabus a midterm project that was a two- to three-minute video that we didn't tell the students this, but it wouldn't really be part of their final grade, but it gave them a really good sense of how long it takes to do this because they're not used to doing it and they can't do it the night before, right? It's not like a paper, not that you can do a great paper the night before. Some people, some people can, right? Some people are really good at it. With, with this stuff, there, there really is no way to do it the night before because if you don't have footage, you can't make a video. It doesn't come out of your brain. So we needed to make them realize that ahead of time so that they didn't 
Um, we really wanted them to be successful, obviously. So that's that's why we did that. Um, so as we were talking about, we, we Elizabeth came up with this idea. She came to us. We threw some ideas back. And it continues to go back and forth and to oscillate kind of around that right solution. Um, and we're still working on it. The, the first semester that we did it, I think we did a really good job. We, we implemented a little bit more training after that. And I think we overshot now, right? So this time, they focused too much on the storytelling and not enough on the science. So now when we do it, this was this semester. So we've, and, But we trust each other enough, right, that we're going to keep working on it. And she just go, oh, this isn't working. And walk away because there's a core there that's working. Um, so now next semester, we'll go back and work on it again. So this iterative dialogue does not never ended for us. And it's not, hopefully, it's never going to end. And that's what we're building up with all the faculty. Um, and and a, like I said, a big part of that that we found is trust. Uh, somebody talked about it. And in the previous session about how uh, sometimes faculty get frustrated when there are outside influences. And we, we want to make sure that we're not um, getting in the way. So um, bringing it home, uh, we have a short video to show you uh, that our media staff at St. Joe's created on this, about this project. So we'll show you the video, and then we'll talk a little bit about the details. <laughs> I've given students iPads and I've asked them to document their entire experience throughout the course. This is a behavioral neuroscience course where students learn how to do brain surgery and conduct their own research study based off of a brain lesion. I really got a sense of um, excitement and enthusiasm from the students when they could tell their own stories. And I wanted to go with a digital story so that they had an opportunity to really share what they've done in a unique way. It's a way to capture their learning without um, asking them the boring details. What I found is that they were engaged with the class, but they were not doing a good job with the presentations. And I think they were getting bored with that medium. In looking for another activity, I was thinking about how to make it authentic. And I thought, what about doing some sort of video that they could produce to reflect on the course material from the semester and share it out um, with others. Students in my class work in pairs. Each pair is given a rat. Many of the students are going to test the rat's behavior pre-surgery. Then they will engage in the surgery techniques, a lesion in the brain. After surgery, the students are going to test the same rats that they may have tested pre-lesion on the same behavioral tasks. What that enables them to do is compare their pre and post surgical performance on any given behavioral task, be it aggression, feeding behavior, or memory tasks. I approach this class very differently than I think most students are used to with a lab class. I like to treat the students as scientists, students as researchers, and I really turn the scientific process over to them. What they're doing with the iPads is following the entire scientific process. The students are collecting still images as well as video throughout the semester, and they're using that to create a final project, which is a educational video that they can share with students outside of St. Joseph's University. What we're doing in collaboration with a local high school is actually sharing out what the students are doing in real time. They're giving a weekly update to their local high school partners, and they're sharing videos and images from each week of what they're experiencing in lab. The goal is to educate them about the research process and to really get them excited about neuroscience. And what I realized was, was that through this collaboration, I could really make that video making process authentic for the students. It wasn't another assignment that I was asking them to do, but rather an experience for them to learn the technology and to share the research process with these kids. I also use graduate students in my lab and in the department to help me with the course. What they do is they spend hours learning the surgical techniques, learning the research methodology, and they can then help the students in their individual projects. And I found this to be really fantastic. Students learn well from their professors, certainly but they learn in a very different way when they can interact with their peers. Behavioral neuroscience is a very difficult course. And what I love to see is that when they interact with their TAs, they're not afraid to ask the questions that they think might be stupid. They're really not afraid to dig in and ask how or ask why. And I like to see that sort of interaction back and forth between the TAs and the students. I rather think of myself as a facilitator of learning 
and what I like to see our students teaching other students. Should we call her a, a movie star? <laughs> She's so good at that, but yeah. Um, so just stepping back for a second from an instructional technology perspective, this is what we present kind of to the faculty. It's simple, I, you know, it's, it's a little bit silly, but it's memorable. So the whole three bears approach that we kind of coined is, you know, if you apply too much technology to a, a learning problem, uh, the students might be distracted from what they're trying to learn and it gets in the way. And that's what a, a lot of faculty fear that you're gonna, because you're the technology person, you're gonna try and throw everything at it. If you apply too little technology, they, for, especially for an assignment or a task that requires some amount of technology, they won't have the tools they need to be successful and to achieve those learning outcomes. So what we're looking for is that spot right in the middle. Um, there's an interesting that, thing that I've learned when, uh, since Apple came out with the watch. Um, they've been, all their marketing, their, their marketing machine is awesome. But uh, there's one little thing that came out that uh, they, they refer to traditional watches and they say, you know, if you go and buy a traditional watch, you can get it with just the minute hand and the second hand. Or, and it, you can get more things on it. So you can get the day, the, day, the date, uh, the moon phase, stuff like that. Traditional watchmakers don't call all of those things features. They call them complications. Because every one of those things they add, adds 100 parts to the watch. So I think that has applications across different um, mediums and across different fields. And I think it applies for us particularly, where uh, we want to make sure that the things we're adding are, are, are really uh, features and not complications, right? We want to make sure that they're appropriate and that they're serving the learning outcomes and not getting in the way. So this is just a quick idea of some of the support that we gave the students because they weren't media savvy, because they were coming into this not knowing what they were getting into. We give MyPad training. One of the uh, websites that Elizabeth really or, uh, that Elizabeth really liked that it sounds like they're implementing in some other classes now. Uh, there's an app called Storehouse on the iPad. You can do uh, rich media blogs, which is how these students communicated out using the video, photos, and text from the iPads. Um, and we did some photo video tips and tricks as well. We also provided some creative workshops. So Elizabeth gave us a lot of class time, which is that trust coming back in, right? Because you don't have a lot of class time to give. So building that relationship is important to get us in the classroom. Um, so we did the components of a visual story. So when they were telling their story, they knew how to do it. Um, and also the roles of video production, just to give them an idea of all the different aspects of, of what goes into it. And we also give them student resources. So there's a website, uh, uh, well, you guys, how many of you guys use Pinterest? Wait, keep your hands up for a second. No man. Oh, one man, sorry. <laughs> yes, that's the first person. Okay, so don't think of this as just uh, for you know interior design or for fashion or for um, parenting or anything like that. There's, there's uh, we use this for all of our media resources for the students. So if you go to pinterest.com slash ATDL, um, that's the acronym for, our, for us. They, we have all the resources for the students in there. It's all visual, and they love it. They use it all the time. And then those are just some of our facilities that we have on campus. This is a, an infographic of the way the project works. Yeah, and I think this is really great. I even have it up in my office because it explains exactly what we went through and what the real solution was to my problem that I walked in with. So we have our students um, who are in the behavioral neuroscience course interacting with local high school, high school students. They were traditionally doing that with the um, blogging, and we blog not only using those storehouse to create the exciting blogs, but we put it through Edmodo. And I don't know if you're familiar with Edmodo, but that's an educational blog. It's very secure because there's security issues with the younger kids. Um, so much of the communication was happening through Edmodo each week, but also some of those students came to campus for a couple campus visit, visits, which was really exciting. And all of the work was being done on the iPads. We put the iPads into the students' hands. They had them throughout the semester to take pictures, take video, and to even generate those blog posts. So they were creating that all there and sharing that out. The only thing that was brought back to the desktop was for some of the final video editing um, due to size. And we found that although I wanted to do everything on iPads, Joe's team said, hey, this is the appropriate place to do it back on the desktop. But this at least gives you a sense of how that all came to be. So happily ever after. And just a quick note, I use Pinterest for parenting and interior <laughs> design, so don't think that I'm being a, a, an evil man. Um, so <laughs> so uh, 
Do you want to speak yeah, to this? No, These this are some great. of the outcomes that we got. This is the data, right? So all of this is happy, touch, touchy-feely, like mm -hmm. the students loved it, Elizabeth loves us, we love her. Um, but she actually captured some data that gives us some, some backing here. Which is exciting because we were able to share some of these results at the um, NARS conference. It's an association for research and science teaching. Uh, but yes, we did a number of measures. And there were changes in attitudes towards neuroscience. Um, there were changes in their attitudes towards their ability to do neuroscience. But I think what speaks most loudly is that their exam scores changed before, um, following the implementation of this project. This project really wasn't related to the content that I was teaching. It had more to do with their research, but it engaged them in the course more fully. So you can see that after implementing this project and this experience, the students performed at much higher levels. And I think that's a really salient thing to share. So some of our key takeaways, we split this into, so these are the three parts of our presentation, and we took one takeaway from each part for each of us. Um, so in that first part about finding each other, from our perspective, it was really important to build that internal brand awareness so the faculty knew what we did, knew who we are, and knew how to find us. And I think from the faculty perspective, I had to ask, I had to go find people, and I had to make sure that I was making the connections I needed to be successful. <laughs> when we were building the product up, um, when we were building the product up, we, like I mentioned a couple times, because it's really important, I think, is to build up that trust with the faculty, show them that you're adding value to the class and you're uh, doing everything to serve their learning outcomes. And for me, although I'm a teacher and I'm always focused on pedagogy and what's right for the class, it was really important not to lose sight of that as I started to embark on implementing technology. And then finally, um, like I talked about in the three bears approach, make sure you're using just the right amount and just the right application of the technology. Don't overshoot, don't undershoot, and once you find that medium, and it may take a while, uh, the students are gonna be served really well by having that technology added in, in the cases where it's appropriate. And this experience has been life-changing for me, and if you ask my students, they literally write about it being life-changing for them. Um, it's a big deal. And I think, don't stop there just because they like it keep going and we have we've changed things and every time we're taking notes and we're tweaking it and making it a little bit better this this year's projects were significantly better although they missed some things um so we're you know constantly tweaking it just to make sure that we're getting it uh, in the sweet spot that's it so this is some of our our, our team back at st joe's and uh the folks from the high school that were part of the collaboration um are we doing questions at the end let's do questions at the end just to ensure okay. everybody has time Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.